Hello, everybody. It's Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. And, you know, I've just completed a series of a two part series of videos where I talked about creating a dividend growth or dividend income, both portfolio in today's overvalued market. And I've got a lot of comments on both of those videos. So I've actually, and perhaps against my better judgment, I've decided to go ahead and add a part three to that. And I'm going to do something uh, very unusual. I've had several requests from subscribers um, to the channel on, on both of those videos, as well as others in the past. So let me share some of those with you and pardon me for reading here. Number one was from Brian Edgeberg, who said, I really enjoy your videos, would enjoy a series of videos where you actually put together a portfolio over the next year or so based on a realistic scenario. I really like that part, by the way. Um, Brian, the realistic scenario part. Most folks have some time horizon before retirement and start looking at dividend investing well before their actual retirement age. Not sure if I am clear here, but if someone had X amount and was retiring in X years, what process would you execute for a dividend income portfolio with decent yield expectations, say 5% upon retirement with some level of portfolio growth expectations? It's a very, very important comment, and I'm going to actually do that. I'm going to construct, show you how I would put together a portfolio that could actually get to a 5% current dividend yield and show some methodologies and processes of how I would do that. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually present three videos or three model portfolios in this video. One will be the current income, one for someone who needs current income with a minimum or, or something close to a 5% yield. Let me correct that. I'm also going to just do what I would call a realistic current income where you could get what the market is capable of giving you. And then I'm going to do one for younger people who might be looking to build a dividend growth portfolio that can actually grow into them and with them as they, you know, get closer and closer to retire, say someone that had 10, 15, 20, or even 30 years. Now, these are all hypothetical and they're all models. And I'm going to put them into the portfolio management tool that I utilize in my money management firm so that we'll be able to keep track of them, keep track of the income, keep track of the capital appreciation if any, obviously, and essentially look at the overall performance of these portfolios built in this very, very difficult market. Okay, I want to be clear, this is not necessarily going to be examples of my ideal portfolios, but they're going to be portfolios that can be realistically, as Brian suggested, put together in today's market. And I also had, you know, a couple other comments I might share with you. You know, it was from Doug Morris. And Doug said, question for you, Mr. Carnival, do you tend to customize slash diversify a portfolio at the GIC sector level, industry level or sub industry level, or is it typically some combination? I'll be addressing those issues, Doug, in this video here. Then Richard the Magician also said, how would you construct a portfolio for somebody who needs to retire sooner than later? I am 39 and I'm sitting here at retirement age at over 55. I might have to retire at that age, but due to health reasons, I would like to at least have the option. Well, what I want to explain here to Richard the Magician is no matter what your needs are, you still have to be realistic. OK, if you can accomplish retirement and build a portfolio that can do that, great. But if not, then, you know, you have to basically take what the market gives you. And I'll kind of try to address that as I go through this video. And then Ollie said, hey, Chuck, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge on this channel. I greatly appreciate it. In this high valued, somewhat dangerous market, I was wondering if you give some advice and research candidates to someone who is in their 20s. So I am going to present a portfolio that allows, you know, that would essentially potentially work for someone who is young. And we're going to track these portfolios over, you know, maybe the next two or three years. I do want to be clear. And, and let me go ahead and do that by going through some caveats that I want to make sure everybody understands. I wanted to put them in writing so that you understand. These model portfolios are, first of all, not portfolios that I would necessarily build for myself. In other words, these portfolios don't necessarily meet my personal goals and objectives. I had set up some hypothetical scenarios, which I'll explain as I go through each of these portfolios. But there are almost an infinite number of portfolios that could be built.
All right, I just really want to make that clear. Next is these models are constructed based on, again, specific but hypothetical goals, needs, objectives, and risk tolerances. Okay, it's in other words, th this would be designed for a certain type of investor who had certain goals, needs, and objectives, not for all investors, and maybe not for you. I want to really be clear about that. None of these portfolios may not work for you. Whoever's watching this video, I want you to apply the common sense and logic that I'm applying here, and I'll d d detail that and you know more as I go through these model portfolios were built on immediately investing 100% of the money in the real world today with the level of the markets like they are how long the bull markets lasted I would probably recommend a more gradual approach in other words I would try to feed the money in slowly I try to be cautious and careful and not necessarily be 100% invested on day one but obviously for sake of illustration we're investing 100% of the money immediately and I'll talk about that as I go through through the construction process. And also these model portfolios are presented to illustrate only three of just numerous portfolio designs that could be implemented in the real world. There is an infinite array of portfolio types that could be built. By the way, I'm basing this on parts one and two of this series, okay? I, I want to be clear. I'm going to build these portfolios from the, the general research candidate list that I put together in parts one and two. All right. So if you haven't watched those videos yet, I would suggest, you know, go ahead and watch them. And by the way, I'll put links to them at the end of this video. So anyone who hasn't seen the first two videos can go there because this is the universe that I'm building these portfolios from. OK. And again, I'm not going to use every company that I put in those research candidates. I'm just going to give you three examples that could be built that are important. But the central idea behind this video is utilizing these models is to illustrate the process and the methodology of a rational and prudent portfolio construction designed and implemented under the general principles of value investing. Okay, it's the process and the methodology that I'm really illustrating here, not specific portfolios or specific recommendations. Please understand that. Please hear what I just said. I'm not saying anyone should go out and build any of these three exact portfolios. These are just concepts that could be built in today's world. And realistically, as you know, I suggested when I went over the comments with you. And then I want to get into some of the portfolio construction methodologies that I went ahead and utilized to build these for you. Number one, I said it's important if you're going to build and construct a portfolio, you need to know yourself. You need to be very, make a very, very realistic assessment of your own goals, needs, objectives, and probably most importantly, your risk tolerances. Because it is imperative that investors assess a realistic appraisal of their own emotional abilities and tendencies. Don't try to build a portfolio that, you know, you're going to panic on and liquidate at the worst possible time, for example. Be realistic and assess. And if stocks aren't for you, don't invest in them. I think that's important. Number two, establish a plan and follow that plan judiciously and resolutely. In other words, I like to say if you're going to have a plan, for goodness sake, follow that plan. But don't just throw a bunch of mud on the wall expecting, you know, to do well. Unfortunately, a lot of investors are almost like moths to a candle or to a light. You know, they'll fly head into the bright light and not recognizing what dangers might be there simply because they watched the Kramer show or they saw, a, you know, a recommendation on the Motley floor. They got excited about some stock. And what happens is their portfolios end up to be disjointed. They end up to be a hodgepodge. They don't really have a soul. They don't really have a clear objective. And they don't really contain constituents that are capable of meeting those goals and objectives. Establish a plan prior to building the portfolio. And then once you build the portfolio, follow that plan judiciously. To repeat what I've already said numerous times, set realistic and specific goals, objectives, and needs. In other words, make sure that you're building a portfolio here that is going to be a portfolio for you. Okay, and the key here is also be realistic. Don't attempt to try to, you know, get more out of the portfolio than let's say the market is actually capable of giving you today. You know, don't sit there and say, I want 10% dividend income because you're not going to get that without being just ludicrously risky. There are investments out there that have those kind of yields, by the way, but they're fraught with all types of risk and dangers and they usually don't generate very good capital appreciation. And also they tend to be, you know, areas where you can end up getting really blindsided. So be realistic here and prudent. I might also add the word prudent there. Number four, diversify properly. 
Street, but not too little or not too much. The great Peter Lynch in his book, One on, on Wall Street, coined a phrase that I really embraced and liked. He said, you got to be careful you do not diversify. Not diversify, but diversify. You know, don't st- add stuff to your portfolio that's actually worsening the ability of that portfolio to meet your goals and needs. Make sure that everything that you're adding to that portfolio is essentially capable of meeting your realistic goals, objectives, needs, and so on. Number five, continuous monitoring research and due diligence is imperative. In other words, you have to manage that portfolio. You know, there's the old Ronco commercial where the gentleman always said, you know, just set it and forget it. You really can't do that with a, with a, with a portfolio, a stock portfolio. Now, I believe in the long-term ownership. I believe in time in the market over market timing. All those principles are real, but you can't ignore your portfolio. Even the greatest companies can run into trouble. Think General Electric, which was just a marvelous business for decades until until, you know, it ran into some trouble. Think of the big banks during the financial debacle, Bank America, Citigroup, even, you know, the largest insurance company in the world, AIG, that got all caught up in this aggressive money lending and then, you know, packaging these mortgages and, you know, leveraging them to the hilt to where they just literally destroyed their long, well-established business. You have to be aware of your portfolio. And that's why diversifying not too little, too much, number four, is so important. You want to be able to keep track of your portfolio. So have enough stocks in there. I'm going to use 20 in the models that I created here. 30, some people like 30. Some people got to have 50 because they just simply can't, you know, stand the idea of having, you know, more than a couple of percentage points in each holding. Again, that's where it's, you know, it's imperative that you assess a realistic appraisal of your own abilities and tendencies. But number six, and perhaps the only real rule that matters as far as I'm concerned, because no matter what type of portfolio you're building, whether it's a growth portfolio, full of growth stocks, or a dividend growth portfolio, or one for future dividend growth or current income, all portfolios, in my opinion, should be built under the strict adherence to the principles of sound fundamental value investing. You know, they apply universally to all types of portfolios, and I think that's critically important. The main process here that I'm going to be implementing is I'm attempting to only build or include stocks that appear to be fairly valued. Now, further research and due diligence might mean that you change your mind on some of them, but the key is you start with that. You know, are these companies worthy of that further research and due diligence because their valuations make sense? Okay, guys, enough of the lecture. Let's get down to the real nuts and bolts of the meat of this process here. You know, I went through in part one and I showed you how I went through and I screened through all these various portfolios like the S&P 500, the dividend champions, contenders and challengers, the dividend aristocrats. I went through the, you know, S&P large cap, the S&P mid cap, and I tried to find companies that were fairly valued. And in doing that, I created this list of 130 plus companies that I called dividend income at value. These were all stocks that paid dividends, but they weren't all the same. Okay. Some of them had high yield. Some of them had low yield. Some of them had low growth. Some of them had high growth, but this created my master universe, if you will. And I was only able to come up with 130 companies. Now, I left out a couple of sectors like REITs where I could add four or five additional REITs. But the point is, the process was these are, you know, stocks that appear to be attractively valued in today's overheated market. And then I further broke that list down into those that had very high yields, okay? And, you know, these were companies that had yields of over 4%. That's trying to get to that 5% number I talked about earlier. Then I created another list of 3 to 4% dividend payers. And then I also created, broke it down to a sub list of 25 to 3%. And then I also created a, a fourth one, which was you know, consistent growth, companies that produce consistent earnings and consistent dividend growth, because these are all different portfolios that have slightly different characteristics that you could use to blend into, you know, different kind of portfolios. And then what I finally did, what I'm doing in this video, I built three portfolios. I built one of equal weight. In other words, I have 20 stocks here where I put basically you know, 5% in every company. And I created a portfolio, and I'll show you that here in a moment. 
And then I created one with, you know, current income model, I call it, where I actually overweighted five of the 20 stocks, where I put 10% in each of those. And then I put three and a third percent into the remaining 15 stocks to boost my yield. And that was the reason, because I was looking for the maximum current income. And then I also have what I call my growth yield portfolio, which is a, a different set. These last two I just mentioned have the same stocks. They just have a different weighting, okay? In the third portfolio, there's some of the same stocks. There is some overlap, but these are 20 different stocks that have more growth characteristics. A lot of the companies here came from this dividend consistent portfolio, and they came from the 25 to 3% dividend portfolio. So let's go ahead and look at these different, you know, companies that I created. Let's start with the you know, I'll call it equal weight current yield portfolio. That's the one that gives you the highest potential yield. All right. And I'm going to use this here, this portfolio tool here, so that you see how I put this together. So what I'm looking at here, I'm going to click this custom tab. I'm going to put the credit rating in the GIC sector and the GIC sub industry sector. Because what I want you to note here is that there are 11 broad sectors. People ask me, do I, you know, one of the comments I shared with you, do I do it by GICs? Well, you you know, the problem is there's only 11 sectors. So if I'm building 20 stocks, I've got to have some overlap in the various sectors. So here are the GIC sectors that I built these 20, you know, stocks with. I've got two in communication services, three in consumer staples. I only have one energy, probably could have had more, but only had one, three financials and, you know, four healthcare, one information technology, two in materials, two REITs, two in real estate, and then two utilities in here as well. But go into the sub-industry category now. And, you know, there are like 75, I think, or 76 sub-industry GICs categories. That's general industry classification system subcategories. In healthcare, I have biotech, healthcare distributors, and pharmaceuticals. In information technology, I have technology hardware, which is HP. In materials, I have diversified chemicals, you know, Chemors and Eastman Chemical. And then I have, you know, a healthcare REIT and a specialized REIT, and I have two gas utilities. So I'm getting as much diversification as the market can give me here with these portfolios. I've got one in advertising out of the communication services, one in integrated telecommunication services, which is Verizon. Okay, so they're both communication services, but again, they're slightly different. They're not really in exactly the same business. I had consumer staples. I've got agricultural products with Ingridian. I've got tobacco with Philip Morris or Eltria, as, as it's currently called. And then I've got drug retail in Walgreens Boots Alliance in the portfolio. So I get the, you know, the, the diversification. Now, what I'm really interested here in is dividend yield. So next, I'm going to click dividend yield. And I'm going to go ahead and move it here where I can focus on it, because this is a major focus. Now, the other thing I want you to see is I'm going to organize this by lowest to highest and then highest to lowest. All right, so I've got three companies in here with dividend yields between seven and eight percent. I've got several here at over four and a half percent. And then as I go down the list, I get into different, you know, dividend yields. This is going to give me a blended dividend yield, which I'll share with you here in a moment. So I'm trying to get as much income, current income as I can in this portfolio. Now, another thing that I might want to look at here is I might want to look at earnings growth. So I'm going to add the earnings growth tab here. And I can even bring that over here because the earnings growth, I'm going to make an assumption assumption here, and it may not necessarily be a valid assumption that the dividend is going to grow commensurate with the company's earnings growth, okay? So this allows me to see where the dividend growth is. Now, my earnings growth is going to, you know, be in the low range on some of these utility stocks, for example, in Verizon. It's going to be in the average or mid-range with some of the other names out here. The average growth rate of stocks has been between 6 and 8% using the S&P as a proxy. And I've got some that get into actual double-digit growth rates. So again, I've got a blend here, and I'm blending these together into, so that they work in one unified fashion, which I'll illustrate here to you, you know, more in a moment. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here with this particular, you know, format. These are the actual, you know, companies, and we're going to go through some of these here with you very quickly a little bit later. So the next thing I'm going to look at, this is the equal weight current income 
I'm not going to go into the current income model and the equal income model, again, have exactly the same stocks, okay? So no use to go, but I'm going to go into the growth yield, I call it, or the above average growth. And here I've got a slightly different set of companies. I've got some companies that have perhaps lower dividend yields, but more estimated growth. I want you to notice the estimated growth characteristics here. There's several that have high double digit and even double digit growth. And almost everything here is on the high end of average or even above average with a few, you know, that don't quite meet that goal. But the key difference between this is for growth yield. The, the dividend yield on these stocks range from as low as 1% to only as high as 3.86%. Okay, what I'm looking for mostly here is the growth yield, all right, on this portfolio, all right? So I'm going to go through these now with you here, and I'm going to go ahead and look at the current income model, and I want to go through these names real quick with you so that you can kind of see what the companies are. I'm going to use the new version of FastGraph, which allows me to load stocks a lot faster, okay? I'm going to go ahead and go to adjusted operating earnings, and I want to make a point here because that's another comment I get and just have to cross my mind, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it up. People ask me why my P.E. ratios are different. It's because I use operating earnings because I believe that's the best relationship between the stock price and operating results or earnings. Now, I can also use like sites like Google, and so I can use diluted earnings, which are gap earnings, and I'm going to get different P.E. ratios, okay? Here I've got a P.E. ratio for Cardinal Health of 21, where if I'm using the operating earnings, which is, has less accounting convention, it, it eliminates non-cash charges. It's really closer to a cash flow model than it is a you know net profit under gap model where you've got non-recurring charges in there. Okay, but here now I've got the blended P.E. of only nine times earnings. So that's why you see those discrepancies. But I'm going to very quickly go through these now with you. And what I want you to note is, as I go through these, is the relationship between the price and earnings. When it's overvalued, you notice how the price moves back into alignment. When it's undervalued, notice how the price moves into alignment. And I would consider this undervalued. And all these stocks need to be trading maybe just slightly above, but at or below the orange line on these graphs. So let's go through these 20 stocks very quickly. There's Cardinal Health. Here's UGI Corporation, which is a gas utility. And you can see the very, very strong relationship between earnings and price, how overvalued it was, how that resulted. Important. Now, the stock has rallied a lot, but I got a 2.89% dividend yield. I've got a blended earnings yield of about 6.4%. I'd like to see that a little higher, okay? But it works. It's still reasonably valued, consider the overvaluation of both. OMC here is nicely underneath the line. I've got 3.8% dividend yield. I've got a PE of under 15, 12.5, and an earnings yield of almost 8%. So I'm going to go through it quicker. This now is a specialized REIT. The company has pretty good earnings here. If you're not familiar with this company, I might, a lot of people won't be. I'm going to go ahead and go into their corporate red site. This is an experiential REIT, they call it, okay? It owns, you know, some really great properties out here like Caesars Palace and so on, okay? It owns 28 leading gaming facilities, has 47 million square feet and 200 plus restaurants, bars, and clubs. It's an experiential REIT, okay? It offers a 4.5% yield. Now, when I'm doing REITs, I'm going to use FFO or funds from operations. But I also want you to see some things here about utilizing a tool like FastGraphs. You've got a really crazy aberrant number here. So to really assess this better, you would want to shorten the time frame where you got rid of those really crazy numbers and tried to look at what I'd call more realistic. No reason to include a 600% increase that blows this average up to 49%, the average FFO growth rate. A more realistic FFO growth rate is something like 8%, okay? And then if I look at the forecasted growth rate, it's 7% or in line with that 7 or 8%. So when you're using a tool like FastGraph, the fact that it has so dynamic capabilities for you, use it correctly. But here I've got a 4.5% yield that's essentially at you know, at fair value using the FFO, which, you know, automatically in fast graphs, it takes, instead of using operating cash, though, it'll put a REIT into FFO. The next one I'm going to look at is Verizon. I'm going to go back to the adjusted operating earnings and let's go ahead and move into Verizon and let's go ahead and blow this up. And you can see the price earnings relationship, how the price kind of tracks where the earnings are. Stock's undervalued. It's got a good dividend yield. I'm going to start going through these fast 
faster now. Here's Omega. This is another REIT. Okay, that I have in here. This has one of my very high yields that I've blended. It's got an 8.19%. In the overweight portfolio that I'm going to show you here in a moment, I've put 10% of the money in Omega. Okay, so that I had a very, you know, a, a nice chunk of the high yield that increases the overall yield of the portfolio, as you see. But Omega is very attractively priced here. I'm going to go back to operating earnings again. I'm just going to go through these quickly now. Here's the utility stock. Uh, South Jersey Industries offering almost a 5% yield, uh, trading at under a 15 PE, which is attractive. Here's Ingridian, which basically makes agricultural products. It's got a 3% dividend yield. And again, I want you to notice how price tracks earnings and how all these stocks are trading at least at, if not below the orange line. Here's JP Morgan. Chase and Company, obviously a diversified bank, a major bank, you might call them. Here's Amgen, which has a 3% dividend yield, very consistent growth. Here's AbV, which I consider to be extremely undervalued. So, you know, here's Chemors, which is a spinoff from Dow Chemical. It's got really great expectations for growth, over a 3% yield. So this could actually technically be turbocharging the portfolio. I did have a comment where they talked about this company being a big polluter. This is something that you would want to determine with research and due diligence. Franklin Resources, the Ben Franklin Mutual Funds, you know, have had a couple of really poor years here, strung together three or four poor years. You can see that hurt the price, but note that their dividend record, they continue to raise their dividend all through. Remember, our focus here is dividend income. I love the valuation. I like the yield. I love the quality of this company. I think it's, you know, it's certainly worth looking at at these valuations. And it's, you know, it's obviously a very well-established asset manager. Enterprise Product Partners. Now, this one, I'm going to also go into cash flows. Okay, because this is an oil and gas storage and transportation company. It's an MLP. It does come with a K1. It offers an 8.4% yield. So it's for that investor that's looking for the high current yield. If you're okay with the K1, you know, a good accountant can handle it very easily. Some people don't like it. And that's why I mentioned these portfolios aren't one size fits all. Some people just really, uh, in fact, I have clients that say, please, no K1s. But, you know, if I'm looking for current income, this is an extremely high quality oil and gas company. If I look at it from cash flows, the dividend's very well covered. You know, I can buy it at a very attractive valuation. I've got a very high cash flow yield on it. And, you know, I think it's obviously worth looking at if you need current income today. Principal Financial Group, this is life and health insurance. You'd want to look at this with earnings. It's very inexpensive. You can see how cheap it got and how it's rallied, about a 3.5% yield. Going on, here's Eltria, another one of the high yielders at 7%. Some people don't like tobacco. I get that. Simply don't put tobacco in the portfolio. It's that simple. This is You wouldn't have this as a choice. So it, again, these portfolios aren't for everyone. Here's Walgreens Boost Alliance, almost a 4% yield. Note how undervalued it is. Here's Merck, you know, which is tracking its earnings real nicely, over a 3% yield. Very inexpensive here. Here's HP, part of the you know, Hewlett Packard separation, which HP and HPQ, um, yielding 2.7%. It's got good growth expectations. It's very cheap, and it has a very nice dividend record of growing their dividend over the last five or six years at a pretty attractive rate. So, you know, it's in there. Here's the other chemical company, Eastman Chemical, offers a 2.5% yield, but it's trading at a very attractive valuation, and it's got, you know, it's got very nice growth potential going forward to be able to generate double-digit rates of return turn in the future. So this is the universe of stocks that I picked. I think I've covered them all. You know, these stocks were for the two types of portfolios that I mentioned to you. Now, there's the third type of portfolio that I'm going to look through, and I'm going to go through it a little bit quicker here just to, you know, to not make this video already. It's a long video. I'm going to try to keep it from being too much longer. So I'm going to go into the growth yield portfolio here. Okay. And I'm not going to cover every company in this group, but I'm going to try to go through and show you the ones that I didn't show you in the last portfolio. So I've added OMC, 
you know, in this portfolio where it's got good growth potential, a 3.8% yield that's very attractive. I've got FMC Corporation, okay, which is a fertilizers and agricultural company. Again, I'm looking for that diversification. It's only got a 2% yield, but it's got a lot of growth expectation built in. So, you know, this could end up generating very strong returns and we could see very high dividend growth. So this is why I call these growth yield. I'm going to look at, uh, here's Science Applications International. It's got a, only a 1.7% dividend yield, but it does have, you know, a nice 8% expectation for growth. It'd give me a double digit rate of return and very strong dividend growth going forward. I hope you're getting the picture here. I'm going to go through just a couple more with you. You know, Raymond James Financial, I didn't show you in the last one. Again, it's got good growth, low yield, but good growth. I've got, nay, I mentioned Amgen here, Borg Warner, which is really participating in the electric car vehicle, you know, potential market. It's got really good growth, but again, low yield. Okay, so I'll maybe show you one or more, two more. Here's um, a very interesting one that I like, which is Spire Corporation. It's got a higher yield, not quite as much growth potential, and it might be the only one in here that's maybe just, a, I'd like to see this one a little cheaper. And I'd like to end with a company like Cummins, which is somewhat cyclical, but it does have very nice growth potential. So, you know, these are different strokes for different folks, if you will. Once again, I want to reiterate, I wouldn't put everybody that came to me in one of these three portfolios. This, these three portfolios would be for people that needed a specific goal. In this overweight, high yield, I call it, portfolio that I mentioned to you, this is where people need as much current income as they can get. Now, I put this into my Advise On portfolio management system. We're going to be able to track this portfolio over the years, and we're going to manage it, by the way. So, it, you know, things are going to change. But the first thing I want you to see is that you know, I've got a little bit, tiny bit of cash. You know, I, I assumed all these portfolios to be a million dollars. And what I did was with this current value, I put the different, you know, amounts of money. Some of them I put 10%. Those are the ones that have 100,000. There's, you know, Philip Morris. The rest of them I put three and a third percent roughly, or around 32 or 33,000, you know, depending, you know, obviously to make it work with the number of shares you buy. But this portfolio would have a yield of 4.85%. That includes what little bit of cash there is. It's 99.44, 100 It's like ivory soap, pure in stocks and just a little bit of cash. But the point is, on a million-dollar portfolio, this would be throwing off $48,500 of income per million. Okay, so if you had two million, it would be almost a hundred thousand. If you had three million, it'd be a hundred and forty some thousand, etc. Okay, but here you've got you know, five stocks with 10% weights and the rest of them with 30% weights. I did Omega with an 8% current yield at 100%. I did VICI properties at 4.5%. Uh, I was one of the lowest of the high yield. But the point is, I've got this 4.85% dividend yield on this portfolio because what I'm after here is I'm trying to get as much income for this particular you know, individual, hypothetical individual as I possibly can. Now, the second portfolio, I'm calling it equal weight current income. Now, what's interesting here is I've got a 4%, 4.08%, we'll call it right at 4% yield. So I'm throwing off about $40,000 per million dollar investment here. In this case, I've got an equal, we'll call it 5% or $50,000 in each of the 20 stocks. Same 20 stocks as you saw in the previous portfolio. The primary difference here is that I've been able to still squeak out a 4% yield. I got almost 1% more income by overweighting it. Time will tell whether that actually made sense or not and whether it was good. But we're going to be able to track this because I'll be able to keep track of the income, how much income the portfolios generate. You know, we'll probably look at these maybe once a quarter, if you will. And then last but not least, I've got the growth yield portfolio. OK, this is the one I showed you last here. I've only got a 2 percent dividend yield. But what I'm after here is growth yield. These are growthier stocks that should increase the dividend growth a lot faster going forward. All right. That's what I'd be looking at. So for the younger person, this should generate more capital appreciation potential over time. And it should also grow the income faster over time so that when you are 5, 10 or 15 or 20 years away from retirement, when you do retire, this portfolio would be generating enough income at that time, hopefully or potentially to meet your goals and needs. And we're going to manage all three of these portfolios and kind of 
report on them. And again, I'm going to do this once a quarter, maybe twice a year. I'm not really sure yet. If you have some thoughts on that, you know, get it in the comment section. But I thought it would be fun, and it's probably against my better judgment. We're going to go ahead and look at these three portfolios that are very similar but also very different that were built under today's market environment. I'm going to close with that. Today's market environment in a better market in 2009. You just see names in here like Johnson & Johnson and Apple and Pepsi and Coca-Cola and Church and Dwight and Nike and Disney and McDonald's and names like that. I think all those names are overvalued, but these are still very good, high quality companies. As you saw, if you went through the portfolio reviews or I did earlier with the fast graphs. Anyway, this has been Chuck Harwell saying thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this series. If you liked it, you know, give me a like. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Ring the bell, you know, pound that like button, if you will. And, you know, I look forward to sharing this updates on these portfolios as we go forward. And by the way, we're going to manage this portfolio. If things change, we're going to change our minds. Thanks for watching. Talk to you again real soon.